This is Dan Schneider. On this Dan Schneider video interview, the subject is Danger Man, the action series starring Patrick McGowan of The Prisoner. If, was it a precursor? Is it a great show? Danger Man is the subject. Is it a great show or not? I have two people who will uh, debate the topic with me. Uh, Fiona Moore appeared on a show I did on The Prisoner a few months ago, or maybe a month and a half or so ago. Uh, and Gideon Marcus on the right is appearing for the first time. Uh, Fiona, like uh, before, if you could give a little bit of background about who you are uh, and your interest in Danger Man. Thank you, Dan. Well, I am a professor at Royal Holloway University of London, and I also write uh, books, articles, blogs, and so forth about uh, television, particularly focusing on cult and classic television. And I co-wrote a book on uh, The Prisoner uh, with uh, Alan Stevens. Uh, it's called Fallout. It's available from Telos Press. And uh, that's how I discovered Danger Man. You know, we uh, uh, bought the series, uh, sat down and watched it with a view to, uh, you know, getting the background for The Prisoner. And to be honest, we were so hooked. We were... Uh, uh, seeing if we could persuade um, Telos into uh, letting us do a Danger Man guide, but unfortunately the uh, publisher didn't think there'd be a market, uh, or as, at least not as much of a market as for the prisoner. So uh, instead we confined ourselves to writing an essay and voicing many opinions. Uh, Gideon Marcus is my other guest. Gideon, if you could give a little background about yourself as well, as well as uh, what drew you to Danger Man. So I'm something of an unusual creature. I'm actually a time traveler. Um, so for the most part, I live my life 55 years removed from you folks. So for me right now, it is September 20th, 1967. Uh, in fact, Danger Man just went off the air after five seasons, the fifth one being truncated with only two episodes in color, which I saw, and they were terrible. Um, but we understand Patrick McGoon will be back uh, at the end of the year or maybe this season in England with a show called The Prisoner. Um, this is all part of a project called Galactic Journey, which can be found at galacticjourney.org. Um, it started out as just a little blog where we reviewed science fiction and fantasy and talked about the space launches. We started in 1958, which is 2013 for you folks. And we lived day by day writing about these things. And we wrote about them as if we lived back then in that context, but for a modern audience. And over the last nine years now, goodness, um, it has grown. There's now more than 20 people writing for it, including the uh, wonderful Fiona, who is here today. Uh, she is actually one of our newest associates, uh, and she writes about film for the most part. Um, and uh, we can now cover everything. And one of the things we do to complete the immersion of living in the past, because it is very different from just sort of reading about the past, doing things one at a time, going back in time to see Kennedy's assassination, whatever. This is fundamental living in the time to appreciate how things work. One of the things we do is I actually have a television station. So for example, if I turn this on, you might not be able to see, oh, Tarzan is on. Let's see if I can tune that in. There you go. Oh, wow. So this is this, is this week's Tarzan episode, which normally would precede Star Trek. Um, and uh, we actually watch Star Trek uh, every week as it comes out with original commercials, with Trek zines of the time, readings beforehand, all those things. So one of the shows that aired on KGJ Channel 9 was, of course, Danger Man, because it was one of the shows that came across the pond. Um, we were very lucky to get it. There's some we still haven't seen, like Doctor Who. And so my daughter and I watched both the half hour episodes and then the hour long episodes. Um, and we found it some of the very best television there was for a whole bunch of reasons, which I won't go into now because I'm sure we'll discuss it during the conversation. But that's how I came to Danger Man. Um, more breaking the mold for just a second. Part of the reason I know Danger Man is my father was a huge Danger Man fan at the time. And he actually recorded clips from it and the theme on reel to reel tapes, which mm -hmm. I grew up with. So Patrick McGowan has always been a part of my life, um, but it was great getting to experience it in context as it came, as it came out. That's me.
Gideon what, Marcus. Was the Tarzan show, was that Ron Ely's show? Say again? Was that Ron, the Ron Ely Tarzan? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, not, I, not, I know that the 60s would have been too late for Weissmuller. The 60s would have been too late for Weissmuller, so it had to be Ely. Um, so uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, how the show came about um, uh, you know, financially, uh, who, who was the person behind it, and also, obviously, how Patrick McGowan came along. Because at the time, he was only a stage actor. Uh, this was the show that made him a star in Europe. Um, but go ahead, Fiona. Uh, well, mainly a stage actor, or at least mainly known as a stage yeah. actor. Um, he'd had a contract with, uh, I think it was MGM for a while, which, uh, you know, meant that he appeared in a lot of films. And also, and this is uh, kind of one of these interesting connections, um, uh, if we're talking about how uh, the series originated, the uh, money man behind it was, of course, Ralph Smart. And Ralph Smart did uh, a lot of the kind of... Um, quickie fantasy things that, uh, you know, were made in Britain and sold worldwide, including to the U.S., including the uh, adventures of Sir Lancelot. And there's at least one episode where you can see a uh, an unknown Patrick McGowan turning up uh, as a very villainous Irish knight. Hmm. Um, so and, you know, seeing uh, with the connection, you kind of got to wonder. Uh, uh, any comments, uh, Mark? Gideon? Oh, I don't know anything about the creation of danger man i only know the the names i've seen in the credits time and time again so i defer to fiona's encyclopedic knowledge on the subject so uh this was a show that came before the real craze of, of james bond and uh you know it he even in the first season says drake john drake in the opening title um i know that there was some involvement of ian fleming uh, early on what you want to mm. talk about that fiona Okay, well, um, Smart originally wanted to do um, adapt James Bond for uh, uh, for television, and had uh, uh, approached uh, Ian Fleming, who was actually up for it. And oh, sorry. Yeah, you never you know, need to apologize for accidental cats. Yeah, um, but you know she may she she may need editing out of the uh, uh, of the actual video interview. Anyway, um, so. Uh, um, but the thing was, they approached uh, uh, McGowan, and McGowan turned it down because he didn't want to uh, play uh, James Bond uh, because he disapproved of uh, uh, James Bond's uh, promiscuity. And then uh, eventually Fleming uh, um, withdrew his permission as well. And so uh, uh, Smart, uh, you know, thought, well, why not do a secret agent series with a different uh, uh a uh, different secret agent. And the good thing about that was that they could, uh, you know, they weren't tied to the James Bond mythos. They could make a uh, secret agent who was a bit like James Bond, but, uh, you know, didn't have the promiscuity and was maybe a bit less about the, uh, with the, uh, the gratuitous violence. So now you make an, oh, oh, so I was going to say, you make an interesting point, Dan, when Danger Man came out, there was no spy craze. Mm. Um, Ian Fleming's novels were out. But there were not not a lot of shows um, or programs, and that's really interesting because it's such an exciting time in the Cold War. It's, it's pure pre-Cuban Missile Crisis. It's it's Khrushchev. It's this cat and mouse between East and West um, because Stalin is gone, so it's not monolithic anymore. It's the second stage of the Cold War. Uh, the the Berlin Crisis hasn't even happened yet. The the second one with the wall. So it's this interesting porous time for Europe that this mysterious man, John Drake, comes out into. And what I really appreciated about the show was it's not portrayed as monolithically good versus bad either. John Drake is an absolutely unabashedly good person, but the people he works for aren't necessarily. Yeah. And in the later episodes, you can see he's getting sort of a bit uh, disenchanted, which has led some people to speculate that that's the natural progression towards the prisoner. But uh, we talk about Bond and Fleming, and then Simon Templer, I think, was uh, the saint. And he also came from the 30s or 40s in a series of novels. But John Drake, this was a totally uh, made-for-television pro uh, creation, right? He, was, he had no antecedents. Right, and the Saint TV show came out in, what, 1961, I think? Yeah, I think so, with Roger Moore. Yeah. Um, 
Go ahead, Fiona. Do you want to say something? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm less uh, up on my, on my saint than I am on uh, Danger Man. Um, but yeah, you know, and it was interesting seeing the uh, series change as the spy craze took hold. Yeah, because yeah. the, the okay. first series, uh, I think I mentioned this on The Prisoner, the first uh, season or series, as it's called in the UK, uh, it's a half hour. And it's mm -hmm. quite jarring in uh, 21st century America, where you've been conditioned that only sitcoms are half hours and dramas are uh, an hour or 45 minutes, whatever they squeeze the commercials in here. Um, uh, the, the, the first season, the shows are so tight. And, and, and you, I mean, it's so, the cl editing is so clipped. I, I was watching one of the epi early episodes where uh, uh, one of the guys who plays number two later on is, is a hitman in the series. And, and Drake has to, you know, go behind the Iron Curtain. And uh, there's a, a, a teacher who's dogging him, a female teacher. They get, uh, they get the uh, uh, wrist, uh, what do you call a wrist, not wrist watch. Um, <laughs> what uh they get chained together and they oh, have handcuffs. handcuffs. Yeah. Uh, they get, they get handcuffed together. He has to go kill the, the killer. And the, the amazing thing is the economy of writing and the acting is just, is just so dead on there. Um, let me just ask for you, when you watch this uh, being 21st century people now, as you are, is there something that uh, just seems a little odd or off? It's just amazing how tight it was. Either one of you. Um, well, uh, Gideon is, of course, culturally from the 60s, so it's not so uh, unusual for him. Uh, but I'd say, uh, I mean, I think the thing is, though, that, um, you know, stories have got natural lengths. I mean, I'm actually quite pleased. Uh, one of the developments in uh, the 21st century of uh, with streaming is that we're starting to see more of a return to 30 minute dramas with uh, things like um, Russian Doll, for instance. Uh, and also that, uh, you know, a, a lot of uh, dramas uh, that are ostensibly an hour long have got quite variable lengths. Also, um, if you look one, I recently, um, we were talking a bit about Star Trek before the show, and I recently uh, decided to be a bit of a completist and watch the animated series. And what struck me about it was how um, it wasn't, I'd expected it to be sort of Star Trek aimed at children, but it wasn't. What it was, was it was uh, um, Star Trek but with the B plot cut out, yeah. you know, and the A plot made a very nice taut 22 to 25 minute story. Yeah. So, you know, the 45 to 60 minute uh, uh, story, you know, how much of that is actually necessary and uh, how much of it is just the format dictated by uh, advertising and network. I would go the other way around. Um, so as Fiona said, I, I, I viewed it in the context of the television I was watching at the time. And there's many things that made Danger Man revolutionary. You compare it to, say, Doctor Who, which is very stagey. Um, you compare it to Star Trek, which has its theatrical origins clear all over it. And Danger Man is very slick, movie-like, well-cut, extremely nicely scored uh, show. Uh, and the first series are interesting because they've got sort of a cool jazz background, which I love. And then the second one's more, more uh, orchestrated. Um, but I would say actually that because of its fast, tight editing, that it actually bears more in common with quote, modern shows. Um, if you compare say Strange New Worlds to, uh, to the original Star Trek, there's no time to breathe. They have to cut every two seconds and it's breathless and a little honestly vapid. Uh, compared to the old one, but people who like the new one say Star Trek was just so slow and staid and lifeless. Um, because, of course, the original Star Trek was terrible at everything it did. Um, so I, I would argue instead that Danger Man was, was prescient um, and really cutting edge cinematography. I'd also say that the half hour episodes are good, but like the animated Star Trek episodes must necessarily be a little shallow or rushed. Um, and I had worried that making it an hour long episode, really, you know, 50 minutes um, would pad things out. But instead, it actually gives the show time to breathe and develop. And what makes Danger Man so good is John Drake is a well-developed character. We learn a lot about him, despite the fact that we know virtually nothing about him personally. Um, and he always has 
fantastic co-stars. Yeah. Uh, and one of the things that I really appreciate is British television, and particularly Danger Man, in part because Patrick McGoohan was, was such, a, ironically, such a conservative and, and, and straight-laced person. But the women in Danger Man get such more progressive treatment than in American shows. Whenever you see a woman on the show, she's usually competent, she's usually vital to the plot, and she's never a love interest. Although Patrick McGowan seems to have these incredible pheromones that make women fascinated by him, um, but nothing is ever consummated. Um, let me just talk a little bit about uh, the opening of the show, uh, because you had mentioned about like the tight uh, theme song. Uh, that bum 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 bum. That that to me is the best of the theme shows. Uh, then I would go with American Secret Agent. And I really thought the I really thought the 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 last the hour long one was just it it was just bizarre uh, and it, it it was ill suited to that that kind of thing. Although although with especially when you get the the opening where he's sort of in negative you know the, the negative man version of him there, uh, it it does it does kind of say that this series is going is going past where it was. Um, can either of you talk about uh, the three major theme songs for Danger Man slash Secret Agent? Do Fiona, you do you have thoughts? Um, yeah, though, uh, you know, I mean, not, yeah, I'm sure you have better ones. I mean, I'm uh, not uh, wildly musical. And so, you know, I'm like, well, you know, I like the Secret Agent one. <laughs> I do. Yeah, I do like the imagery in the series, but, you know, uh, I'm uh, not a, a jazz aficionado, so I'm sure you can speak to it better than I can. How old are you, Dan? 57. Okay, so you you are vaguely of that time. So it's interesting you say that. So the, the opening for Danger Man, which is one almost no one is familiar with, uh, is interesting, especially because it seems like Patrick McGowan says the uh, recitation a new every time sometimes he says nato also has its branch and sometimes yeah. he doesn't and i'm never quite sure why that changes up every so often but it is an exciting punchy theme and it's very quick and gets you to the show very quickly um the secret the high wire which is the which is not exactly the theme of this of this hour-long series but more of the intro because the theme is just the bum 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 yeah. bum bum bum. That's the black and white. That's that's the very quick. And then you have the teaser. And then they'll play high wire. Invariably, John Drake is driving his very very tiny car through the streets of London. So I love that song, and it is very very much in keeping with the mid '60s in England, with the harpsichord and 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 just the delightful whimsicality of it. My brother. When he was three years old, when that song would come on the air, he would that would be his cue for him to get on top of his hobby horse and then ride it back and forth as fast as he could. So I happen to love that theme. And in fact, interestingly enough, a friend of mine, brand new to the journey, his name is Elijah. He started watching Star Trek with us. He heard High Wire on KGJR radio station, which, by the way, is also accessible if you go to galacticjourney.org. <clears throat> And he was so entranced by that song. He said, I have to have a copy of this song. I have never heard music like this before. Mm. So I'd say that High Wire was actually quite a success. And it was, it was a, a top 40 hit in England for a while. As for Secret Agent, the Johnny Rivers song, um, I grew up with that record when I was a kid. It's, it's, a, it's a cool song, as my, as my young daughter would say. It's a bop. Um, and in fact, we saw Johnny Rivers on Hollywood Palace, which is a contemporary variety show. And he came on and he played the hell out of that song live. Uh, and that was quite a treat. And that is something people can see if they, they go on their YouTube and watch. But we saw it live as it came out. Johnny Rivers playing Secret Agent. And it was amazing. It is, it is quite refreshing how important and integral music is to Danger Man. Um, and I don't think it's something that can be overlooked. Although if you're not a music aficionado, then it's something that you will not notice but you will appreciate even unconsciously. Um, so with the, with the, the opening too, you mentioned about the NATO stuff. Um, and in the second season, it seems that he isn't working for NATO. He's working for MI6, I think they call it. Yeah. Um, MI9, made it up. Oh. So stay out of trouble. Yeah. So is, is this, the, is this, I think people talk about, 
in universe, the diegetic universe. Is that the, is this the same John Drake in both series, or is it sort of like a, a, a rebooted uh, universe? Well, that's one of the things that uh, I like about uh, the uh, Danger Man. Actually, is the way it does sort of reinvent itself, and you know, it's a Good question. You know, we're talking about an era that approached television uh, quite differently uh, to, uh, you know, how we do it. You know, we would say, uh, you know, there has to be a reason why all this has changed. But uh, no, they could leave uh, his affiliations quite vague. You know, have him working for NATO sometimes and MI9, so M9 other times and some uh, very, uh, you know, you know, his... Uh, Ethnicity is even kind of ambivalent, you know, whether he's uh, uh, Irish, uh, English, uh, American Irish at one point, yeah. uh, that sort of thing, you know. So um, it is, uh, but, you know, they, you know, this was something that people would kind of take for granted because there wasn't this uh, culture of recording, you right. know. It, there, it, it also gives it, wiggle room for the prisoner files who, who want to, you know, say Drake is the prisoner. It is, but also in some ways, uh, uh, I think uh, The Prisoner as a series uh, needs to be understood in context. Some bits of it uh, seem quite um, strange to us that I think would be less strange to a uh, 1960s audience. Um, you know, like um, the, the prisoners constantly playing with the idea of doubles and doppelgangers. But when you think of the number of people in Danger Man who appear play in uh, the series playing different roles and Drake never says, you're a dead ringer for that yeah. school teacher that I uh, met in Russia or anything like that. Well, uh, yeah. so, uh, yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's like the old odd couple television show here in the U.S. where there's like literally four or five ep episodes that tell different ways that Oscar and Felix met, you know, <laughs> which is the real one. Well, but at the risk of. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Fiona. No, no, it's your turn. Um, at the risk of being pedantic, two things. One, there was a recording culture in the 1960s. It was yeah. on audio tape. Yeah. Uh, but they definitely, I mean, my father recorded episodes. Um, Real to Real could, could go for hours. And while you couldn't get the video, at least not until 1965 with very specialized recorders, um, everyone, well, everyone who had the equipment was taping yeah. episodes because you never know if the reruns were going to happen. In fact, um, if you read the fanzines for Star Trek in 67, mm -hmm. they talk about, they constantly are referring to t recordings of episodes that they have so they can get the script right and whatever. Um, the other thing is, is I read an interesting article in, this summer in a newspaper about the, uh, the end of Danger Man and the coming of the prisoner. And the article made it clear in no uncertain terms that John Drake is back in this new show, The Prisoner. So, and he's named John Drake in both series. I don't think there was any sort of, well, is he actually the same person? That That's a modern construction. Back then, we would have known they were the same person. Go ahead, Fiona. Uh, McGowan uh, famously disagreed. McGowan was very adamant that this was a different agent. I'm, spe I'm talking about between the two Danger Man shows. Um, I, I don't think McGowan would argue that season, series one and two okay. and series three and yeah. four were different. So I was thinking we were talking about the prisoner and the is Drake the prisoner thing. No, because well, uh, Gideon, yeah. you actually did say the prisoner, so you must have misspoken. Yeah. Um, Sorry, no, it's my but, confusion. But let me just ask then, uh, between the secret agent American version and the Danger Man version, here in America, uh, we're famous for our prudishness. Were there any cuts? Were there any like, acts of violence? Was there any just times when uh, whichever American network said, no, no, we're not, you know, you have to cut that scene for America. What, what were there famous battles over any uh, episodes that aired in the UK that didn't air in the US, something like that? I'm not aware of any. And actually at that point, I'd be pretty surprised if there were, because again, this is uh, Ralph Smart and uh, ITV. And they were making uh, the series with one eye firmly on the American market. I mean, this is why they recorded it on film, where uh, the British has ser series like Doctor Who that weren't made for overseas consumption. Uh, well, you know, they, they would be sold overseas, but it was kind of a secondary market, you know, a bonus, whereas uh, ITV was quite firm that they wanted these to have overseas sales. And so uh, they would have been, I think, uh, you know, keeping an eye on what the American standards were for uh, sex and violence and uh, trying to keep within them. Yeah, I would uh, think it would go the other way. In fact, um, as I recall, the, the, the market that was the most fastidious was Australia. Yes. 
So I, I wouldn't worry so much about America as opposed to England. Yeah. So one of the things I think, talking of uh, the series, one of the interesting things I think is that the uh, series seems to kind of gain a confidence to be British between, um, you know, season one and season two, that, uh, you know, there was this kind of, uh, you know, um, attempt to make it, you know, a, 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 I guess, you know, there's a, there seems to be a nervousness in the first series that uh, Americans won't watch a show where it's not uh, American. And then, then, as you said, as, as we've been saying, you know, the spy uh, craze happens and this, oh, OK, Americans might like a British spy hero right then. OK, off to London and here's your mini. <laughs> you know, there's nothing more British than, uh, a, I mean, you know, uh, it, it's a delightfully unsexy car for a spy to be driving, but it's also delightfully British. Let's turn to uh, some of uh, the major themes and a, a few of uh, the sort of touchstone episodes of season one. Might as well start at the beginning. Uh, Fiona and I were talking about Port Mirian uh, before you joined us, Gideon. So, uh, Fiona, if you want to talk about that first episode, View from the Villa. Um, yeah, where he was, uh, uh, it was Polycentra, wasn't it? Uh, Port Mirian actually uh, pretending to be, uh, you know, a... Uh, um, an Italian uh, town, you know, which uh, is not, is, is how it mostly appeared, you know, up until uh, the, the prisoner. Um, so, yeah, just looking for my, um, my notes on it. So, um, I remember this one. Yeah. So if you want to just jump in for a moment. Yeah. You got, you got yeah. it, Fiona? Yeah, you go ahead, Gideon. <laughs> I, 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 don't, I don't have much to say on individual episodes and commentary. These are all episodes I saw more than a couple of years ago. Um, I, so I, I remember them, but I, I, I couldn't give you creation details or anything. Well, how about what, what uh, major themes do you see uh, in the first season uh, that some which may have continued over to the rest of the show and others that may have uh, faded away? Uh, we thought uh, Fiona mentioned sort of the Britishization by the second season. I'm trying to remember if there was as many political shows, because one of the things I remember strongly about the hour longs is that uh, John Drake is often ensuring election security um and and keeping democracy safe in all of these brand new countries and i don't think he does it that much in the first series in part because that's a dynamic that hadn't really developed yet 1960 was a watershed year in terms of new nations and united nations membership you had all these former colonies in africa suddenly becoming their own self-determining nations um, and I, so I think those plots happen a lot more in the uh, in the hour long episodes. Well, the f the first one I think is in in the fourth or fifth episode where it's in Saudi Arabia and the, the trafficking and the human slavery. Um, go ahead, Fiona. Yeah, um, it, it 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 wasn't always the uh, you know um, it, it had its moments. Um, I was going to say I think. Uh, you know, the uh, as the as the series got longer, it got able able to be a bit more nuanced about things like uh, colonialism and uh, you know, elect as you said, you know, sort of elections and uh, democracy and so forth. Where uh, the first season, possibly because it had to be tighter, was a lot more kind of uh, you know um, pacey, but a lot more uh, focused on the black and white morality where the uh, later on, you know, you start to get uh, questions about, you know, the morality of spying. I mean, it never goes into Callan territory where you're, uh, you know, kind of like really actively questioning the whole, uh, you know, are, how are these people really meant to protect us? But still it starts uh, playing with it and also like asking, uh, you know, questions about, you uh, um, you know what's what's good, what's bad, who sh who's uh, who should really be uh, you know out and doing what to whom. It seemed that the, that uh, you talk about uh, Maguwen Maguwen famously being uh, prudish in terms of sex and uh, objectification, but this a lot of violence. And I read somewhere that uh, someone once wrote a critic said this is the most violent television series he'd ever seen to that point. Um, and uh, even though he didn't doesn't use a gun. Every single episode, at least in the first season, there's fistfights galore. Uh, what, what's your take on uh, his, his uh, pugilistic prowess? 
So um, I think it's significant that he doesn't use a gun um, because so many shows were using guns. Westerns at the time were full of guns. Um, if anything, what it reminds me strongly of is the contemporary show Route 66, which came out in the late 50s and in the early 60s. Uh, and that was a show with two people basically Jack Kerouacking around the country from job to job. And every single episode also had a fist fight. Um, so I, I, I think in many ways, Danger Man was restrained comparatively. Um, I think on the set violence and also a little certain amount on the sex front, uh, Danger Man tends to have its cake and eat it too. You know, uh, he doesn't use a gun, no. But as you said, there's a lot of fist fights. And also, uh, you know, there are other people with guns. So uh, people who uh, are narratively are deemed to deserve death do tend to meet rather convenient ends, just not at John Drake's hands. Yeah. Um, and it's the same. I mean, yeah, you know, uh, it, it, it is uh, certainly advances portrayal of women and, uh, you know, women with agency. And, uh, you know, although John Drake never actually sleeps with any of these women, you know, he is in a job where he gets to meet quite a lot of lovely women, which I think provides a vicarious thrill for the audience. Um, one of the things that I did notice, especially about season one, that seemed to sort of fade uh, in the later hour long episodes is that there seems to be a, a quite a, an anti-capitalist uh, streak there. Uh, in one of the episodes, uh, I, I remember my wife always brings up the line, there's a chuckle that said, Posing as a simple-minded millionaire, you know he's at he's at some gaming table, and that that that's Drake's introduction. Posing as a simple-minded millionaire, uh, and he goes about, and there's all these little things where you, you're seeing whether it's uh, the uh, trafficking human slavery, whether whether it's uh, seeing uh, the rich get their come up, and uh, anyone who has money seems to be corrupt uh, or whatnot. Do, do you think that the show did have a, a, a political stance uh, regarding capitalism? Either one of you. Fiona? I've never really gotten that sense, you know. I mean, it was uh, it, it was never afraid to, uh, you know, sort of, uh, have, uh, you know, moralize. And certainly, uh, you know, I think in the uh, uh, in in the uh, '60s, uh, you know, as as at any point, you know, there is uh, always, you know, what the, there's this British expression, well, specifically Yorkshire expression, uh, where there's brass, there's muck, you know. If uh, if somebody's made money, they have to have done something bad to do it uh, to do it, or you know possibly one of the, you know their parents did or something. But there's always uh, something nefarious in that kind of wealth. So uh, you know I think that might be uh, you know something coming out there. I mean, what do you think? Behind every fortune, there's a crime, is the old saying. <laughs> I, I think uh, Danger Man explores corruption in all of its all of its modes. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I think it's, you know, uh, uh, Acton's dictum, right? Um, wealth is not necessarily bad, um, but corrupting wealth is. Power is not necessarily bad, but corrupting power is. In terms of the difference between the feeling between the first two seasons and the latter two seasons, I think the main difference between them is simply a matter of Danger Man is a very topical show, and a lot of its plots are taken right from the headlines of the time. And 1960 was a different time from 1964. There were different countries of interest at the time. So that's you're, you're going to have things set in Yugoslavia um, and, and you're going to have East versus West agents. But, it, but you're going to find more Latin American plots in the earlier ones and more African plots in the latter one. And that's something I want to talk about real quick. Um, Danger Man was notoriously bad at portraying Asian countries for the most part um, and not great at portraying Latin countries. But it, whenever they portrayed Africans, they had quite a big cast of black actors. Now, it seemed like they had pretty much every black actor available because they tended to recycle them in, in revolving roles through, through different episodes. But if there's an episode that takes place in Africa, virtually everyone in the cast will be black. Um, and I really appreciated that. It lends not only that, but... Even in 2022, Africa often gets portrayed as it is in the 30s, mm. you know, um, whereas Danger Man does a good job of going, this is an African country. It may be new, but it's civilized and a democracy and and th they're people just like we are and we just need to help them stay on their feet. But yeah. that's the case everywhere because we have corruption in England, too. Mm -hmm. 
Haiti came across quite well uh, also in one episode. You know, they uh, they managed to avoid the voodoo cliches for the most part, and where they were there, it was on the part of a white man, you know, trying it on and, uh, you know, getting uh, caught out. But I think I think you're talking about the context, but I think some a lot of that is the context in which the show was being immediately made. You know, um, in Britain in the early 60s, uh, a lot of Africans, a lot of Caribbeans, a lot of uh, Indians. India also comes across pretty well. Uh, you know, Zia Moyhedon turns up in, uh, in uh, uh, one of the longer episodes as well. And uh, but they're not there's not so many people from Asia or the Middle East just then. You know, that would come later. You know, so I think people right. are kind of more aware of Africa, African countries as places, you know, real places. And uh, same with India, people are kind of, you know, it's uh, it's not sort of something far away and exotic. It's people live also living in the same city as you. Before we move on to the second season, I want to just ask one thing about season one. Uh, Drake uh, seems to have what a lot of the spy shows did and even James Bond is that he seems to have gadgets and he seems to have uh, a lot of talents. Uh, is, is Danger Man ever so slightly a science fiction, fiction show the way that say Mission Impossible was uh, in that you have these little gadgets that in real life, they seem plausible for the, the time and the era, but uh, they may not have actually been there. So, and, and this again would lead into the prisoner thing since that definitely has sci-fi elements. Um, but is Danger Man set in that same kind of universe? Is is it just a few years ahead of us technologically? I don't even know that it's supposed to be ahead of us. What's what I found so interesting about Danger Man is the gadgets. There are gadgets, but they're all reasonable gadgets. You know, pneumatic guns, small cameras, little little bugs. They seem like things that could have existed at the time. They they were not ridiculous like James Bond gadgets. Mm. Yeah, towards the end, they started to head a bit in that direction. But I think that was the point at which everybody was seeing the writing on the wall there. Um, but yeah, I mean, if, is it science fictional? I would say it depends on the episode. You know, um, it could tend into um, a sort of a cutting, uh, you know, a cutting edge uh, mode that might be five minutes in the future. But um you know, it, it it depended on the story and the episode that was uh, the you know that was going out. So season two goes to it's a couple of years later. Uh, the, I guess the show did the show not do well in syndication or, or ratings wise. Why was the, why was the half hour version uh, dropped? Um, it uh, bombed in the U.S. and in, in uh, you know it went straight into syndication in the U.S. and it bombed. Uh, the thing that saved it was that it did really well in Europe, mm. you know, uh, continental Europe uh, really loved it. And uh, then also in between was when, uh, you know, the, um, uh, the, the the bond thing happened. So uh, consequently, uh, you know, they uh, thought, right, let's, uh, you know, let's try again and uh, only let's make it longer and let's, uh, you know, maybe think of it a bit less as uh, something for the American market and more as something that we can uh, sell worldwide. So uh, season two, first episode, Gideon, uh, it seems to me, as I recall, uh, it has it has a Bondian feel to it, different than uh, the the initial 30 minute run, uh, 30 minute shows did. Um, uh, do they stay, do you get a sense from that first hour long episode that, oh, we this is a redo where we are now we we are free to do it in a different kind of way i got that sense so that's that's the episode where he um he's trying to find out who's killing agents and so he hires an organization to kill himself so he can trap them i i did not feel a tremendous difference in tone or uh or or motif between the two. And part of that is because we actually watched the first season of the hour longs. And then we watched during the summer reruns, we watched the half hour ones. And then we watched the second season of the hour longs. And so they felt more of a piece. And I think that's actually kind of a way that Americans might have actually seen the show too, because uh, Americans can't binge at the time you watch whatever is on, whether it's summer reruns or not. Danger Man was one of the more popular summer rerun shows because it was long enough to go into syndication. 
Um, so we got more of a gestalt view of it. And I, yeah. I never felt like there was a, a dramatic change um, between John Drake of the second series and John Drake of the first. Yeah. Question for Gideon, did they show the episodes in uh, random order or did they, you know, I mean, you may not know, but uh, I'm just interested because I remember, uh, you know, the um, uh, Star Trek episodes in syndication, quite often the local station would just kind of like put them out any old how and, uh, you know, it was uh, a real revelation in some ways to realize that there was actually a certain amount of uh, minor level continuity going on, at least in terms of, uh, you know, who uh, appeared in what season and what, what Kirk was wearing, you know. Almost so assuredly in random order. Once they go into reruns, for instance, when um, when I was running Star Trek reruns over this summer, their first season reruns, I would also check the, the TV listings in the paper to find out which episodes of Daniel Boone preceded and which episodes of Dragnet succeeded. And, and they were always random. There was no rhyme or reason to it. In fact, by the end of the, the summer, they stopped running uh, current Daniel Boone season reruns and started running se uh, season two reruns for no apparent reason. So I want to just uh, talk about a few of the episodes that stand out in my mind. And some of them I may be uh, mixing up. Uh, Fiona and I had did mentioned on the Prisoner show a, a while back uh, the episode Colony 3, which I think is one of the standout episodes. Uh, and it, it's based upon, uh, like you said, a, a real thing. There were Russian towns where where they were westernized and, and they were drilled for 10, 15 years before they were sent out uh, on intelligence mi missions. Um, what did you think of that episode, Gideon? Uh, it, it was interesting and creepy. Um, and definitely one of the two or more episodes that presaged the prisoner. Um, that's 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 what I have to say about it. <laughs> uh, Fiona, just to recap your your opinion from the last. Yeah. Um, well, you know, uh, assuming I'm not uh, worried, of course, since I haven't seen it uh, immediately, that I'm confusing it with another one. But you've also got this kind of reversal of roles, uh, um, to where uh, you know. Uh, um, Drake is actually the one who has to try and pretend to uh, conform to, uh, you know, the uh, the rules and uh, also to, like, stop other people from uh, rebelling, you know, just to, right. in order to discover. So you've kind of got this um, anticipation of the themes of rebellion, but uh, reversed in that, uh, you know, Drake can't blow his cover and he can't uh, have anybody else uh, doing the same. Is that the one where he has the typewriter that's also a radio? Um, it might be, yeah. It might. He, 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 he typewriter. He does take it apart. There, are, there are, there is something in there. Um, I was just looking. Another one that I found, and Fiona, may, uh, maybe you know this one uh, well. The Battle of the Cameras was an interesting uh, episode, um, and because it, it's not, it's not really, uh, it's not really violence, a battle per se, but it, it, it is sort of a game of wits. Do you remember that episode? Um, Which one is it? Battle of the Cameras. I don't remember my auxiliary brain that I call Google's does. <laughs> yeah, I was right, actually. It was uh, Colony 3. We've got Randall, who's... Uh, you know, trying to uh, rebel against the village, and uh, um, Drake is the one basically trying to stop him from rebelling. Yeah, yeah. I, I honestly, that's one of the episodes I don't remember. Okay. Mm. Well, I'll tell you which one I do remember. Go ahead. So this, this is kind of interesting. There's one episode where he um, works with an Indian actor. One of the few times that he they have a, a true ethnic background mm. person there um, named Khan, and Khan dies yeah. about two thirds of the way through. But there's a a lovely cat and mouse between them. Khan is, is a local policeman, but he's worked with Drake in the past, and they've clearly had a relationship. It's one of the few times you get some hints about Drake's past. Now, this is going to be interesting. I'm going to talk about another Drake, Tim Drake, who was Robin, the third Robin uh, in the Batman universe. Mm -hmm. There's a fellow named Chuck Dixon who created, who didn't create the character, but was pivotal in defining him in DC Comics in the 90s. And Chuck Dixon was so prudish and straight-laced that Tim Drake did not like women, did not associate, well, I mean, not, not like women, but there was no carousing, there was no casual anything. 
And the entire community decided, well, Tim Drake obviously is a closeted gay person. And by the way, recently in DC has actually come out and said, yeah, no, Tim Drake actually is queer. Chuck Dixon, of course, no, I had no intention of this at all. And yet when you have a fellow who spurns the attention of women, who never expresses any interest, um, how else do you read it? Yeah. Pa Patrick McGowan created this character who seemed to have no interest in women, who got all, who had all these fanatically loyal male friends, particularly this one, which had an almost flirtatious demeanor to it. And, and you can say, absolutely, there's no way that John Drake is gay. And yet there's so many subtle cues that he could be read as such. Yeah, and uh, there's uh, certainly a whole uh, literature out there on queer readings of The Prisoner, which if you take uh, The Prisoner as kind of a comment on uh, spy series, yeah, you know, the man who's friendly with women but never, uh, uh, you know, never never takes it any further, that uh, he uh, um, has, you know, the, the trope of the uh, spy, uh, you know, male-male um, uh, spy friendship, and also... Uh, within the village, you've got themes about entrapment and, uh, you know, the people comment on the fact that symbolically when uh, the prisoner uh, uh, leaves the village and meets his fiance, he's literally wearing another man's face. So, you know, what's that say about their relationship? Um, an episode that I know in Danger Man circles is often talked about is the ubiquitous Mr. Lovegrove. And I, that's, yeah, so we talk that's about certainly that. a very prisoner like it reminds me of what is it the A, B, and C is the episode mm -hmm. in the prisoner. Um Fiona, you obviously know that one. Could you talk a little bit about that episode? Well, yeah, you know, this is the dream logic one. You know, uh, Drake has, in fact, had a car accident. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. And uh, so, but, you know, we don't quite find that out at first. So what we start doing is we start seeing this uh, strange, surreal thing. And it's very prisoner-esque. You know, you've got marble busts, uh, you know, a bouncing giant ball, uh, people turning into uh, doubles of uh, Mr. Lovegrove, who's Drake's boss, you know, uh, Drake fighting his own reflection, you know, and sort of a little bit of a postmodern thing when Desmond Llewellyn turns up. And of course, uh, you know, he was uh, best known as Q even at the time. Um, and of course, you know, at the end, you know, it's all a dream, you know, but, uh, you know, there there is this sense that uh, uh, a dream-like story with spy elements could come out of that. I mean, that's the one that, uh, you know, if you had to, if I had to pick an episode of Danger Man, you know, and uh, I'm not having to pick, say, the most typical or a good one to introduce a new people, you know, sort of a, what's your actual absolute favorite episode? Well, probably uh, the ubiquitous Mr. Grove, Lovegrove would be uh, top two or three. Wasn't that one actually directed by Patrick McGowan as well? Yeah, I think it was one of them. Yeah, he directed a few, quite a few, which also led into The Prisoner because he developed his behind the camera confidence. So what's really interesting is uh, I read a newspaper article about the coming of The Prisoner. Mm -hmm. And uh, they talked about how the show bombed in the U.S., which is why it didn't get renewed. But mm -hmm. he also talked about how the uh, the fandom of Danger Man tended to be far more intelligent than the average fandom. Uh, that their letters were erudite and articulate, yeah. and, and they, they was a very cerebral fandom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can believe that. Certainly it's a thinking person's uh, uh, spy series. So another episode that uh, stood out and uh, I, I thought I'd have uh, like a, a nice listing of the episodes. I should have gotten my uh, DVD case, but uh, um, parallel lines sometimes meet. And this is the episode where uh, atomic scientists go missing. Oh. And uh, the, the one scientist, I think, doesn't want to go back into the, the world of like espionage and all that danger and whatnot. And Drake actually is sent to, to recover him, but actually sort of lets him go. Uh, and, and to me, this is go, goes back to what I was saying earlier about, about the whole capitalism thing is this show, uh, John Drake uh, seems to be a man who has his own mind about things and he's not a, a, a slavish follower. And this is one of the best episodes, I think, that uh, if I got the episode correctly, is the one uh, which shows this the most. Um, do you think that the, if you if you remember this episode, do you think this is a, a key episode for Drake's development? And if Drake is number six in the later, this is one because we see that both sides, there's not much difference as one of the number two says in one of the prison episodes, you know, them, us, you know, what what does it matter? Um, 
What what does this episode say about the development of John Drake? Go ahead, uh, Fiona. Um, well, they they do the um, uh, you know the scientist uh, rejecting. Uh, you know, the uh, being horrified by their creation and uh, rejecting um, uh, the uh, establishment uh, more than once. I mean, there's also Dangerous Secret, which, uh, you know, is a scientist who, uh, you know, discovers a bacterium uh, that could be used for germ warfare and uh, goes on the run. And uh, yeah, I mean, I think this is, uh, and Gideon will uh, know more than I will, but uh, this seems to me to be very much reflecting anxieties about science and its uses at the time. You know, you have uh, scientific developments coming out, but all at the same time, you know, uh, what are they being used for? Where is it going? Um, you know, what, uh, you know, is it all right because we're on the right side? And so, uh, you know, you'd think, uh, you know, in terms of the moral development of Drake, you know, uh, it would be, he may not say say so aloud, but it is the sort of thing that does get people asking questions about their job. You know, uh, uh, what am I doing it for? You know, what, um, if these people, you know, are uh, disturbed enough by what they're doing to go on the run, you know, what am I doing, uh, you know, trying to get them back? And as I said, you know, he uh, is able to make the right moral choice because he's a moral man and, uh, you know, let them uh, go. But, uh, you know, it's uh, something that uh, Callan would also cover a few times uh, later and with much more uh, tragic results and a much more amoral hero. So, uh, you know, it seems to me to be something that uh, is uh, an exploration of what you do about this situation that everybody found themselves in to a greater or lesser extent. They, they, they really have, uh, they really play with morality in the one episode where he's supposed to rescue the fellow, the guy who turned out to be a Nazi war criminal. Yeah. Mm, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that, that, um, and and the uh, and the people there are actually Israelis, uh, which was an interesting episode. Was it season three that episode? That was definitely one of the the hour longs. Yeah, yeah. He's definitely more tired in the in the second installment, but he's always he is always um, his lodestar is is goodness and making sure people have the happiest endings they can get. And doing everything within his power to ensure that they get their happy ending while not outright necessarily disobeying orders. Mm -hmm. um, which which was the episode where he plays the servant and the 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 head of the house is a real son of a bitch and uh, he has a really great scene where he tells them off there. That's another one that now I don't know was that supposed to be a, a class commentary on uh, British society at the time? Gideon, you know which episode I mean. Well, of of course, um, but but at the same time, I I don't know that it goes beyond uh, stuff that people were already thinking at the time. Um, that was the one with the uh, the train set, right? Yes, yes, I believe so. I John Drake is so hilarious because one thing he cannot do is play servile. <laughs> well, Laura, like. Laura yeah. and I we watched the show. We used to talk about how you know John Drake would he 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 do drunk very well or he'd do affable or whatever. But the second someone wasn't looking at him, game face. Yeah, it was just very intense. Yeah, no, I, I'm just thinking. Have I ever seen McGowan play any kind of servile role? And the answer is no, 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 no. Even in hell, hell, hell drivers, you know, he is the hell, you know. Um. On Probably the last episode before the two color ones, the one that, that really sticks in my mind, and then I'll ask you to pick out a couple of episodes that, that you, you could recommend, is the Not So Jolly Roger, where it's a pirate radio station. And that this is sort of almost as if it, it, it almost reminds me of something like Alien. You know, they're out in the middle of the, the sea. There, there's a killer or, uh, out there or someone, you know, who, who's throwing people into the drink. Um, uh, and it, 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 it's got a, it's got a, again, yeah, almost a science fiction feel, although clearly, you know, it's, it's a regular oil rig or whatever it is that's been repurposed. Um, uh, what is, what is your, any comments on that episode? For some reason that did stand out to me as an interesting episode. That is the last one. And it's an interesting to go out on. And again, a very topical episode since pirate radio was top of the news in 1965. Um, that's another episode where John Drake really has trouble because as a DJ, you have to be able to loosen up. And one thing John Drake can never do is loosen up. So Fiona, any comments from you? 
Um, yeah, similar. You know, it's uh, really uh, interesting seeing it from the perspective, the point of view of, uh, you know, the pirate radio uh, culture that was going on, but also, uh, yeah, it's definitely got a feeling of something that's being made by people who aren't of that pirate radio culture and who kind of aren't sure how to access it. So, um, so yeah. Gideon, uh, I mentioned a handful of episodes here. Are there any couple of episodes you want to speak about, about that either lend to Drake, uh, his character arc, or the, the whole of the series as it, as it came to a conclusion? I think one of my uh, one of the ones that stands out for me is when he befriends someone he he suspects of being a, a, a double agent. Um, he's a music lover, and so uh, he he stages a, a a scene at a bar where he will have bought a, a bunch of classical records, and a bunch of kids will will beat him up and break his batches and fudges records, and. Uh, and he's a, a mild-mannered person wearing glasses and a, and a, and a fisherman's hat. Um, and this fellow befriends him in this, in this clearly staged scene to gain this person's confidence. Whenever we get to see John Drake really act um, and really be someone different, and then yet sometimes give indications of who this person might actually be, um, those are my favorite. Fiona. Yeah, um, I actually, it's interesting we were talking about the post-colonial ones earlier because uh, the ones that stick in my mind are often the ones like the Galloping Major or uh, uh, the Colonel's Daughter where they're kind of, uh, you know, there there is this element that they're, uh, they're uh, looking at, uh, you know, the uh, consequences of independence and uh, people, uh, you know, trying to find their way towards democracy and, uh, you know, I liked in a way, I think that uh, there wasn't this sense of, you know, kind of a, these people need us to show them what democracy is more just kind of uh, uh, these, uh, you know, the, that uh, they, they are people struggling with uh, the same problems that anybody in the world is uh, struggles with politically, you know, corruption, uh, foreign influence, um, as you said before, capitalism and uh, its uh, interference in the political process. And, you know, um, you say Drake's development as a character. Well, in some ways, that almost pose, you know, does Drake ever develop as a character? And is he supposed to? Because, I mean, we are talking about an episodic series. And so while you can say, you know, there are certainly some episodes where uh, Drake's morality is tested and where Drake has to come up against a lot of the uh, moral dilemmas of his day, you know, um, it, uh, does does his morality ever, uh, ever really genuinely uh, change? You know, it may slip a bit but does it ever genuinely change well what what distinguishes john drake uh, uh from other similar characters uh simon templer uh james bond we, we know them but there's also the mission impossible crew there's the man from uncle uh what's his name Ilya karyakin and uh, uh napoleon solo um yes they, they are, are similar in so, some ways but do we ever get a, I don't think we ever get a sense of what makes John Drake, John Drake. And it's that kind of uh, internal gray zone that, that I think lends perfectly into, and we'll get talking about into the prisoner uh, uh, that, that it seems like a logical growth of, of the character in the sense that uh, what more could you do with John Drake in the spy milieu? You had to get bigger. You had to get grander, more, more existential. Uh, I, I, I disagree that we don't know who John Drake. I think we know who John Drake is more than we know who any of these other people are. Simon Templar is is interesting um, and a fun character, but but in the end, shallow. And the Man from Uncle is a, is a truly shallow show with two characters who are nothing but a mass of stereotypes. Where John Drake, you put him in a situation, and there's lots of situations. There's like eighty episodes total. And given the situation, you know what John Drake is going to do. You may not know how he's going to achieve it, but in the end, he has a very defined moral code and he will not deviate from it except insofar as he must for his job. And in which case where he has conflicting issues, um, he will find the way around it that causes the least harm. And if, if he is unable to cause the least harm, he will suffer genuine mental consequences in terms of grief, in terms of doubt, and feel in terms of guilt, which ultimately does lead very nicely into The Prisoner, because The Prisoner is all the tale of a broken down man. 
Fiona? Um, yeah, I kind of agree. You know, when you were saying, you know, what makes uh, Drake different to Simon Templar, James Bond, I would say, you know, that, uh, you know, it is that uh, unlike a lot of them, he does have uh, a clear moral compass and a clear set of values that uh, he applies and, uh, you know, that he applies regardless of, uh, you know, who who's purportedly employing him. And, uh, you know, regardless of whether that goes uh, against uh, their values. And um, yeah, as I said, you know, I, uh, I, I don't see a, a moral arc, but I do see uh, a, a very definite uh, a distinction, you know, that, and again, you know, another good com comparator to get in the opposite areas is Callan, where uh, Callan is in some ways a bit cipher-like, you know, we uh, find out uh, things about his past and his character, but he is cipher-like, you know, it, it's, and, you know, he has been so worn down by uh, the system that, you know, he just really doesn't care, you know, he does not really have much of a life, well, he does not have any life outside of spying, you know, he goes Who, who is this? Um, Callan? C-A-L-L-N? Um, oh, oh, yes. Yeah. Edward Woodward's um, rotate, uh, interesting parallel in that he has a rotating cast of bosses, you know, and uh, some uh, and, very... Uh, and what, what is the name uh, of the series? I, 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 I didn't hear it. What, what is the name of the show? Callan. Just it's Callan. Also the name of the main character. Okay. C-A-L-L-A-N. It never my, comes out in the United States. Uh, right, okay. Uh, but it is uh, also, it, it's, it's uh, very much a it's a spy series but it's very much a negative portrayal of spying but exactly at the same time as danger man is uh, going out you know this one is kind of basically saying uh, spies are not uh, glamorous exciting globe trotting people you know your spy is a uh, shabby sad man who goes home to his london bedsit and paints his model figures you know and uh, his closest uh, friendship is with um, a a deadbeat so uh, you know it's uh, something to look at as a comparator um, in that the spy is very well characterized, but the characterization is almost that he doesn't have a character. He's a cipher. He's a non-entity. If there's a spiritual successor to, uh, to Danger Man, I would say it's I Spy, um, because I Spy is another show that's very sort of naturalistic, featuring two people who have strong moral compasses and are often ordered to do things that are not great. I right. don't really know what I'm afraid. Um, well, it's an American show. I don't know how much it was syndicated in England. Um, first season was 65, so it was actually contemporaneous with the second season of Danger Man coming out in America. And honestly, it was one of the golden times for us on television between season four of Danger Man and season one of I Spy. Uh, it, was, it was terrific. I'd say one of the things that characterizes uh, John Drake, too, vis-a-vis -vis James Bond, is John Drake is competent. And James Bond is actually hideously incompetent. Um, and never is that more apparent in, say, Goldfinger, where pretty much um, Pussy Galore solves the entire movie. And he does virtually nothing except be somewhat disgusting. <laughs> I hate James Bond. I'm just going to say that right now. This is, James Bond is stupid. Uh, you had mentioned uh, uh, I Spy. One show that doesn't get really thought of as a spy show, but which came out in the late sixties, in the late sixties, that has a character that reminds me to a certain degree of John Drake is Hawaii Five O Steve McGarrett. Now I don't know if uh, in in Britain, but you're both uh, from Canada and America originally, right? So you would know that show. We do get a little bit of background information over the twelve years that that show was on about Steve McGarrett. But he's someone that really has has that kind of uh, a magoon esque kind of like I'm just doing the job. It's just me. It's it's not quite the you know just the facts, ma'am kind of thing. But there is some international intrigue with Chinese and Japanese uh, 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 spy spy games and what not in some episodes. But McGarrett does seem to have that same kind of intense focus and a total aversion to to. to giving of himself. Um, d does that uh, ring any uh, true with either of you about, about McGarrett of uh, Hawaii Five-0? Uh, is, is McGarrett Jack Lord's character? Jack Lord, yeah. 
Yeah. For, for me, Jack Lord is a bit player in a bunch of sitcoms, uh, uh, not sitcoms, but uh, of, of other shows. He doesn't have a show of his own. And honestly, I have never seen a full episode of Hawaii Five-0. No. So, I, I, it'll be on the station in a couple of years when it comes out, but, uh, mm-hmm. but I've never seen it. No, okay. How about you, Fiona? Do you know? Uh, I'm similarly uh, okay. disadvantaged because although uh, I'm pretty sure I must have seen an episode or two at some point, uh, you know, on the repeat, I honestly can't uh, say I remember very much about it at all, other than that uh, it was set in Hawaii and uh, uh, crime capital crime. of the United States. <laughs> It sounds a bit more like, uh, I mean, the current series, uh, Death in Paradise, which is, uh, you know, a British series, but it's set in a Caribbean island, so they can have the pretty locations. Well, we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about some of uh, the connections to the later show, Prisoner and and John Drake. And uh, when I did the show with Fiona on The Prisoner a month or so ago, uh, uh, Gideon, I talked about one of the episodes, the the penultimate episode, uh, uh, where the number two is, is beating down on... Uh, number six, and he he says either in the morning break or in the morning Drake, and I would argue that, that I hear the definite D, and also because of the you can pause it and slow it down, you can see the D uh, being uh, uttered rather than the B. B. But uh, Fiona uh, w- was arguing that basically that they uh, this was made in a, a world before you had you know the capacity mm-hmm. to slow down and, and see stuff. And that it, it was in the script, it says break. Um, can you, uh, Gideon, give the pros and cons of and why uh, is Drake number six pro and con, the, the arguments? Uh, there are probably legal reasons why John Drake is not uh, the person in The Prisoner. Um, like, I don't know if, uh, if Pat McGowan had the right to be John Drake in his own show. So, for instance... Um, there are three movies starring Clint Eastwood made by Sergio Leone in the 60s, and they all came out in America in 1967. And interestingly enough, you can, you can say that they're all the same character. Legally, they are not. An Italian court ruled that the Clint Eastwood character in A Fistful of Dollars and the Clint Eastwood character in A Few Dollars More are not the same person. And the reason why is Sergio Leone changed production companies between the two films. Mm. And the original production company sued him because they said, well, this is our character. You can't use him without our permission. And he said, this is just a Western guy. Just because he wears the same sarape doesn't mean he's the same character. He doesn't even have the same name. And an Italian court ruled, that is correct. These are not the same character. So I have to wonder if part of the reason for Patrick McGowan's insistence that they are not the same character was legalistic. And I do not know the answer to that one. Yeah, I think that's probably the bulk of it, but go ahead, Fiona. Yeah, well, I mean, there was, uh, there, uh, that uh, that would certainly have been an aspect, you know, there's overlap between the production companies, but, uh, you know, it's uh, two different production companies making two different uh, series, and you probably don't want to start getting into issues of rights and uh, the like. I think also spiritually as well, though, uh, you know, a lot of people have seen The Prisoner as almost a psychological reaction to Danger Man, you know, so, uh, you know, is is The Prisoner Drake? Well, in a sense, you know, uh, uh, The uh, Prisoner is Patrick McGowan resigning from being a secret agent and yet finding that the world won't let him not be a secret agent. Yeah. So, uh, you know, you can say there that there's, uh, you know, a um, metatextual, if you like, or symbolic or spiritual connection in that, uh, you know, the man who played Drake is now somebody else, but, uh, you know, is still, uh, you know, can't uh, leave it behind. Well, I, I, will, I, I will have a controversial opinion. Mm-hmm. I don't like The Prisoner very much. Um, have any of you seen the anime Evangelion? Came out in the mid-90s. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, big fan of it, I'm afraid. Right. So I'm happy for you to criticize it, though. That, that is a show that Ano, the, the creator, Hideaki Ano, wrote the first half and sold it based on the first half mm-hmm. and then had a mental breakdown. And so the second half of the show is his therapy sessions put on screen, mm-hmm. which is why they make no sense. And anyone who claims to know what the second half of Evangelion is about doesn't because it actually, by the creator's admission, is not about anything. And even Evangelion, the second half, is a Rorschach test. You ask any 10 people what it's about, they cannot give the same answer. Danger, uh, Danger Man is the first half of Evangelion. It has a plot, it has a point, it has a script. And the second half 
is the prisoner, which by McGowan's own admission, especially with the final episodes, he was just writing as he went along. There is no point to the prisoner, and a hundred people can tell you what the prisoner is about, and none of them will agree with each other. And there are great straight jackets you can put it in, and there's terrible straight jackets you can put it in. My wife's favorite is that um, the prison, the the uh, village is actually a kind of post-traumatic help that has been arranged to try to get John Drake out of a, a mental breakdown. And this is the only way they can they can elicit the old John Drake back from this mental hell that he is in. Yeah. And that's very nice. But yeah. it could be anything else, too. And it fits to some extent. I mean, when Alan and I were writing our guidebook to it, actually, we wound up taking a multi-pronged approach, like uh, for each episode, providing three or four different interpretations and, uh, you know, letting the, uh, you, you know, but, you know, not not settling on a uh, on uh, on a single one. Because, yeah, you know, we're like, well, you could read this from a Freudian perspective or you could read it as uh, some kind of uh, allegory of childhood or you could read it as, uh, you know, um, uh, something else entirely, you know, which which I think is the prisoner's strength. I mean, the reason why I think it's stuck around so long is, uh, and, you know, constantly being shown in schools, in university uh, film clubs and the like is because, you know, uh, as you say, it's a Rorschach test. People sit but, down, try and figure it out. But it's a, but it's a sham, right? Because it, it, it suggests that it has a meaning and, and yet it doesn't actually. And I, I find that kind of annoying. There's really I, I, only three I would, episodes I would, I would of disagree. The I think, There's I think John of... Drake almost makes it out and then doesn't. John Drake almost cracks and then doesn't. And what the hell just happened? And then that, that's I, it. I, I, I would disagree. I mean, I think you're falling into the intentional fallacy. It doesn't matter what I as an artist create. It's what you get from it. Um, the idea that the, that the art, artist has the last word on something is, is simply not so critically. I'm, I'm, you, you, I can say that it's about A, B, you know, if, if I write a poem and it, it's about uh, Hitler's invasion of Russia, uh, of Poland or Russia, and you think it's a, a, a poem about my, my little dog, uh, Fifi, uh, something's wrong, but it's not necessarily that uh, you're wrong uh, as, the, as the viewer. I, I get death of the author. That said, the, the point of art generally is to communicate. And if you fail to communicate, I think you failed as an author, even if you inadvertently, the viewer see something. If I take a pile of shit and throw it against the wall and someone says, you have just recreated the Sistine Chapel. I see so much. You have, you have broadened my horizons. That's great. And if you want to pay me a million dollars for that pile of shit on the wall, I will take it. But... As an artist, it took me no skill to throw that pile. Yeah, well, but but McGowan isn't Jackson Pollock. <laughs> no, and and there's some fundamental skill to what they're doing, right? It's obviously the people who made the prisoner had artistic ability because they created something which was slick and interesting. And even if it had no message it was actually trying to communicate, at least in all its random phosphors gave you the impression that it did. Um, but that's why I like Danger Man better, because I feel like Danger Man is also professionally put together and interesting, but also has things it's trying to say. Um, and it says them while still allowing some room for interpretation. So, Fiona, I'll give you the last word on the prisoner uh, uh, Danger Man thing, uh, if you want to rebut uh, Gideon. Well, you know, I won't rebut because, you know, as I said, the prisoner is what you uh, what you make of it. And but. Uh, you know, I did find, uh, you know, one of the things uh, re researching it and analyzing it is you do ha have to go a little bit mad to do it. You know, we found, uh, both Alan and I found that you, we did have to go a little bit mad to understand it. You know, uh, somebody, I was in Port Marion the other week, like I said, and uh, you know, so I was telling somebody about this. She was like, what do you mean? I was like, well, we'd sync up random um, uh, playlists of indie music to, ep uh, to episodes. You know, I will never see the general without thinking of the song, girl, I want to take you to a gay bar, you know. Um, but, you know, did, did this allow us to come to a definite conclusion about it? No, but it did help us, I think, a little understand the mindset it's coming from. So, yeah, I mean, uh, possibly uh, a positive, uh, you know, a more positive take on it is to see it as uh, kind of uh, uh, throwing throwing off, you know, the uh, the linear uh, uh, structure, throwing off the, uh, you know, the ideas that things have got to begin and end and have a middle and all that and just kind of going, woohoo, you know, we have no idea what we're doing and we have no idea if we're going to succeed, but we're going to have fun.
That that is a fun way to do it. If if you think of it as just this big improv with all these characters yeah. and, and motivations, then that's kind of exciting. I have a question for you, Fiona. The two episodes that make up the third season, the color episodes that supposedly take place in Japan, but are actually quite terrible. Yeah. Why are they so bad? Uh, it's a very good question, which I think I would have to do a lot more research into the series to find out. I think a lot of it is that uh, the will was certainly no longer there on the part of uh, a lot of the people making it, including McGowan. And I think there was kind of a sort of a last ditch attempt to uh, reboot the series. Like, you know, we did it uh, once in 64, you know, maybe if we just radically change the format, we can, uh, you know, breathe new life into this thing. And in fact, uh, you know, the answer is kind of no, you know, we've actually run out of road. So Gideon, this, uh, this uh, episode, this show is going to be called uh, Why Danger Man is Great. And I want to ask you that, but I do want to ask one other question of you, and then I'll, I'll go to Fiona to end it. Um, I had, in, in The Prisoner Show, I had mentioned a couple of shows uh, shows that were very similar to The Prisoner uh, and or Danger Man. I wanted to know if you had seen any of them. She had not seen them. One, in 1965, in the U.S., there was a show called Coronet Blue. It starred, it starred Frank Converse. Uh, it's about a guy thrown overboard on a ship. He, he comes to and people are out to kill him all he remembers is the name coronet blue does did you have any idea of that show do you know that show? oh yeah um that show actually just came out from in fact uh just ended from my perspective it was a summer replacement show on i think abc yeah um and and i watched a lot of it It was an interesting attempt to be hip sort of a combination of the plot to Shen, a man called shenandoah and the fugitive i guess and um it's 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 a fair show. It's not it's not bad. I I honestly do not see a lot of connections between it and uh, and the prisoner. Yeah, uh, there was one episode with Alan Alda called like Six Months to Mars that was quite interest interesting because he's in a he's in a what I guess you call it not a replicator but he's in a he he's in solitary confinement in in a capsule going through that. But um and ha have you ever seen the nineteen ninety five show Nowhere Man? No, no. Okay, because uh, that also has a lot of uh, 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 prisoner uh, references, and also a couple of Danger Man ones. But uh, so let me just ask you then: uh, Why is Danger Man great? And someone who's never seen it nor heard of it before, why should they seek it out? Um, it is not only excellently made television in every single way you could measure it. And not only is there a lot of it, so so you can feel perfectly satisfied when you finish it. It says pretty much everything it needs to say, which may be the ultimate reason why the third season was bad and superfluous. But it is also a window into the time um, like no other. If you, if you want to see Europe and catch the Cold War zeitgeist and at the same time see excellent quality television, uh, there's no better way. Same for you, Fiona. Why is Danger Man great, and why should someone who's never seen it watch it? Well, to be honest, my opinion perfectly echoes Gideon's on that, you know, in that, uh, yeah, it's brilliantly made television, it's a beautiful moment, and it also encapsulates, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, uh, the concerns of the time, the, fear, the fears, the thoughts, the hopes. Um, possibly I'd add to it that uh, it's optimistic about people in a way that, uh, you know, Bond or Callan or, uh, you know, uh, Le Carré or uh, a lot of others of the time aren't. And, uh, you know, yeah, it's good that people were questioning it. But sometimes, you know, if you want a 60s series that's uh, about spies, but it's uh, st stylish and uh, fun without being misogynist and exciting without uh, questioning our, the very existence and the nature of democracy every, everywhere on the planet. Yeah. Watch Danger Man. You'll love it. Well, I'll link to both of your websites, uh, Galactic Journey yep. for Gideon and also a doctor of many things at WordPress for, for uh, Fiona. Uh, a good conversation, so thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dan.